Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So they began, <clears throat> for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the other son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has He has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, You killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. I encourage you to have your bulletins handy. Uh, they've got your scripture readings for this week as well as space to, to take notes uh, so that when the Spirit speaks to you, 
Uh, which I know will happen. You can jot those notes down. And for all of you worshiping at home, make sure you've got a little notebook with you so that you can take those notes as well when the Spirit speaks uh, so that you can remember what God is speaking to you today. Will you pray with me? Gracious and almighty God, we come striving to hear your word. And so God, I ask that you would, that you would make your message known. God, that the words that I speak would no longer be my own, but the words that I speak would be your words. Your words for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I know that I have told you uh, parts of the story where my wife and I met. She immediately starts shaking her head. Uh, but I want to give you a little more background to that story. Uh, a little more background to my side of the story. See, I know that you might ask her after worship, and she might tell you things a little differently, but we must understand that we view our stories through our own lenses. So while the story is in essence the same, we have differing views. So first, factually speaking, we shared a music stand and orchestra. I was not that good with my violin playing, and Sherry was much better. Uh, I still say that she played down to my level so that she could share the music stand with me. (laughs) This is important, so please remember that part of the story. So, in fall of 19, I think it was 1984, actually, no, it was 1985, no, it was 1984, I entered Rockford West High School, a large school on three floors. I was intimidated not only by the size, but also the many, many students that were there. I think my graduating class was about 600. Uh, I was a freshman, which meant that I had to watch my back at all times, right? You remember being a freshman? I was also almost six foot tall and weighed all of 120 pounds. I don't have a picture for you, sorry. (laughs) I was not an academic student by any means, and I also wasn't into sports. I found my niche in the music department. I played in orchestra, I sang with the a cappella choir, I also got involved in all of the musicals, getting, uh, getting actually my debut as the high tenor in the barbershop quartet of the music man, the Buffalo Bills. (laughs) So I was doing all right in school, making some friends, surviving that first year, but then this cute girl was set next to me in the second violin section. We began a friendship, but little did I know where this was going to lead. And here's where our stories might differ. Although she might agree, she pursued me. (laughs) Even having her friends ask me if I was interested in dating her. After a little while of following me around, friends asking if I liked her, I finally got the nerve to ask her out. The rest, I guess you could say, is history. But I will always remember how she pursued me. So now you remember from last week, we talked about prevenient grace, the grace that comes before, you remember this? The grace that comes before, that we, that we talked about how God pursues us and desires to reconcile the relationship that we have with our Creator. You remember that, that Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree, they hid from God, but God still searched for them calling out to them, drawing them back into this relationship. This is prevenient grace. But today, we talk about justifying grace. Justifying grace. This is the moment that we make a decision to follow Jesus. The easiest way I always remember this this type of grace is you say justifying grace. It says justified, never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's justifying grace. You see, in the beginning, God created everything. God created the sun and the moon, the day and the night. God created all the animals in the water and on land and in the air. And then God created humanity and commented that it was very good. God placed humanity in the garden and life was good, right? It was wonderful. But then we messed up. 
We did things we shouldn't have. We sinned against God. We broke the relationship that, once, that we once had with our Creator. And once we realized that this had happened, we longed for a restored relationship with God. But not only did we want that relationship, God wanted it as well. And I think that's really important. God wanted that relationship. Remember the first page or so of this particular sacred book, that very first page, is all about creation and how things were good in the garden. The rest is all about God calling us back into a relationship, the relationship that we were created for. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see how God fulfilled this salvation plan. And then Jesus calls out, like we hear in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, Jesus says, and I will care for you. I will love you, and I will save you. John gives us that powerful message that for God so loved the world that, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is a gift. A gift of grace offered to us for just believing. It's not a reward for doing all the right things because honestly speaking, how many of us have done all the right things at all the right times, all the time? This gift, this relationship is one of self-giving love, not of rules and regulations. This is God's desire, but it's our decision to make. It's God's desire, but it's our decision to make. Whether we believe this message is up to us. Justifying grace is at work in the moment that we say yes to the relationship God offers to us in Christ. Our acceptance of that grace, our saying yes to that grace, changes everything. Everything. Think about the story we just heard. We can easily see how justifying grace is active when the younger son comes to his senses, realizes that his father's hands have it so much better than he does, and then he makes a decision to go home, to repent, to turn from what he was doing and go home. The son decided to return to the home he once knew, even if it meant that, that, that his relationship with his father was going to be different even if that relationship was going to be different. Remember, he wanted to be welcomed, not as a son, but as a hired hand, an employee on the family farm. That's what he was looking for. When we accept God's grace for us, we say yes to the one who has been calling out to us. We say yes to the one who has been pursuing us from the very beginning, desiring to be in that relationship with us. Saying yes changes the relationship we have with God completely. The son was separated from the family, off doing his own thing when he makes the decision to go home and he is welcomed back right into the family. He receives a robe, he receives the, the family ring signifying his rightful place next to his older brother. We also have to realize that, that this returning home was an act of faith. Responding to God's grace is done in faith. We don't do anything. We don't do anything to merit or earn the relationship with God. It is freely given. You need to only accept it, welcome it, and flourish in it. Many times justifying grace is found in this theological concept of salvation. We make a decision to follow Christ, to believe fully in God's love, and we experience spiritual healing. We experience forgiveness, and we receive this new life. We are being born again, as Jesus tells Nicodemus. 
I was carried into church. I was carried into church and grew up through Sunday school, church choir, youth groups, and so many other parts of church life at Beth Eden United Methodist Church. Making a decision to follow Jesus was not something I remember like the story of the prodigal son. I didn't ask for my inheritance and then run off and live a a wild and crazy lifestyle. Therefore, I don't believe I have ever had one of those dramatic conversion experiences. You know, kind of like Paul when he sees Jesus. And probably some of you. And frankly, I used to be pretty jealous of all of those who did have them. That would tell their stories I wanted to experience that life-altering decision and, and a return home to this great big party. But then I remembered the older son. The older son was always in the father's presence. He had everything he could ever need, but he couldn't see it. Did he ever have a conversion experience? Did he ever come to a point where he needed to make a decision to fully trust in God, to fully trust in his father. Although it's not really spoken of in the story, I think he did. And it might have come right after the father went outside. Yes, the father went outside to find the older son. He pursued him. I wonder what you would make of the father pursuing the older son, but just waiting on the porch for the younger one. Maybe a topic for another Sunday. But you see, this told me that even though I grew up in the church and had always felt like I had a strong faith, there were times in my life that I felt abandoned, times that I said or did the wrong things that separated me from God. I still needed those moments of confession and I still needed to experience justifying grace. Sherry and I attended a a DeGarmo and Key concert in Rockford back uh, somewhere around 1988. During that concert, I felt like God was speaking to me through the music and the testimony that they were sharing. And by the time we reached the end of the concert, my heart was opening up. And then Dana Key invited everyone who felt like God had been speaking to them to come forward. Yes, I went forward for an altar call. I'm not even sure I remember how it happened. I just started walking down to the stage. Once there, we had prayer over all of those who were gathered at the front, and then they invited all of those people that were in the front into this back room where we could talk with the members of the band. They shared more of their stories. They prayed for each and every one of us. There was a moment that things changed for me. And it was that moment, that moment that I decided for myself that I wanted to be a Christian. No longer was it something I did because that was what my family taught me. That's what I was supposed to believe because this is what my Sunday school teachers told me to believe. This faith was now mine. The faith was now mine. Maybe you can relate to that story where there wasn't this huge conversion experience in your life, but there was a moment that you knew that this is true for me, not just because somebody told me. Salvation is not a one-and-done thing. It's not a once saved, always saved. Salvation is instantaneous, but it's also continuous. John Wesley, you see, had this ordo salutis, or what they call an order of salvation, which includes prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace. We're going to get to sanctifying grace next week. But salvation, you see, is a life that we live into. Within this process, I guess you could say that it is correct in saying these comments. I was saved by grace. I am saved by grace. And I will be saved by grace. All three are correct 
And all three continue. The process of salvation continues throughout our life as we keep saying yes to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As we continually say yes each and every day, the process continues. So let me, <clears throat> let me wind this up with a couple of comments about God's activity in justifying grace as well as our response that comes from God's activity. You see, justifying grace is a double acceptance. First, God says yes to us in creation and then again in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. God created us for this relationship. But when our love failed and we strayed from the calling God has for our lives, God spared no expense by offering up his one and only son, so that our relationship could be reconciled with God. But this is also our acceptance of God's offer to us. Justifying grace is when we say yes to God, desiring that outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our lives. God appeals to our wills. Through prevenient grace, God calls out to us, asking us to return, but he never forces us into it. God never forces us into that into that decision. We have this free will to choose, to decide for ourselves if this is something we believe. It is God's grace that gives us this freedom, and it is also by God's grace that we are able to choose. And so have you made that choice? I know a lot of times we think about this where we've, we've been in church. We've all celebrated so many different things in church have you made that choice? Have you felt deep down inside that your faith is your faith? That it's not something that others are telling you that you have to believe, that it becomes truly your faith. Do you want to make that choice? You want to make that choice. John Wesley would, uh, would regard Holy Communion, the sacrament of Holy Communion, as this grand channel where we receive God's grace. And we're going to celebrate that sacrament here in just a moment. And so I want to give you that opportunity to, to really think about your life, to think about where you are in your life and whether or not you have truly come to that realization that, that my faith is my faith. And it's not because others have told me to believe it, but I truly believe it for myself. And so I, don't want, to, I want to offer you a little bit of that space today. And so I want to I want to share uh, I want to share a song with you. And during that song, I just want you to to reflect on that. The words are going to be up on the screen, so you can certainly sing along with. In fact, I encourage you to do that, to sing along with me. But just think about where God is speaking to you today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns 
unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His word, my hope, secure. chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be here forever mine will be Forever, mine. You are forever. 